I thank you guys for coming out. Um, we've got a pretty big group, so uh, we'll try to keep it moving. <coughs> I'll get the um, all the the legal stuff out of the way first. I'm Bob Ritchie. I'm a certified Texas Master Naturalist. I wear lots of different hats. I uh, I do a lot of uh, nature education. I'm also a master composter, private pilot, father of two kids. It could go on and on and on. Um, but most importantly, I'm not a doctor. So all the plants that we're going to eat today, before COVID, I typically walked, oh, between 750 and 1,000 people a year. Um, if we do have some foods to try, there's a lot of people here, so we'll try to we'll try to accommodate that. You're welcome to say I'm good. Uh, I will let you know that as far as I know, no one has ever gotten sick from anything that I have handed them to eat. Um, and I will eat everything first, just so you know. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna start with, with some basic information and um, start with a quote from my friend John Wolfe. I don't know if any of you guys know John Wolfe. He was an herbalist, amazing person, but he said cities are just nature under siege. And that's really what we are, you know. And, and most of the plants that we're gonna look at today and talk about are things that would be considered weeds. So back in the 1950s, um, when Vietnam was going on and then also the Korean War after Vietnam, there was a lot of chemical companies in the United States and they were making a lot of products for the war, for the war effort. One of those was Agent Orange. And they made lots and lots of Agent Orange, dumped it on everything. And when they were finished with the war, when the war was over, all the chemical companies were looking around trying to decide what we we're gonna do with all this Agent Orange. We're making a bunch of money and we don't wanna quit. And they found us. So they convinced us that our yards were not supposed to have any weeds in them, weeds quote unquote. Um, and they convinced us that we needed to start buying this chemical. Roundup is one very, very tiny chem chemical composition different from Agent Orange. It basically is Agent Orange. And we've been hoodwinked into thinking we need to put this on everything um, and keep it to, so we can have these perfect manicured lawns. Well, most of, like I said, most of the plants we're gonna talk about, they're weeds, and most of these plants had um, medicinal properties, and all the Native Americans that lived here knew all about this, but we ran them all off without asking them. So we're having to go back and kind of rediscover all this. So um, so this is, this is, we are in the Blackland Prairie, so this, <clears throat> this talk is, is edible, medicinal, and useful plants of the Blackland Prairie. So we will talk about some plants that you can't eat, uh, but that also are very, very useful. So uh, I'm gonna start with this, live oak, Quercus virginiana. So um, back in the day when there was big, tall sailing ships, they would use these trees uh, for certain pieces. So like on a big sailing ship where you've got the where you've got the bow and then all the all the wood pieces come around and they all connect in the front and then you'd have the mermaid. Well they would go out in the woods and they would pick a piece that had a shape that they wanted like say this this notch right here. They would cut it and then they would age it and then they would use that on their ships. Um, so another thing about this tree is that on the, on the, up on the branches, and I don't see any right here, there's a little insect that lays its egg and the tree produces a gall that goes around that egg. So forever, before we figured out how to make ink ourselves, ink was produced from the galls on live oak trees. So all these things, they're still, they're still they were bought and graded, and I guess it was by the darkness. I don't know exactly how you do it, but um, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States were both written with live oak ink gall ink, as well as all of Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks were drawn with live oak ink gall ink. So, I mean, that's just, you know, this is just a little plant. So, um, also like, um, you know, plants, everyone always asks me, so why plants? So, plants are this magic interface between the energy of the sun and our life on Earth. I mean, without plants, we really wouldn't be here because they make our oxygen, they make our food, they, they are our life source. And um, so it's, it's important to know these plants um, and, and what they do. So um, we're just, we're gonna start right here since everyone's standing, we're not gonna walk very far. We're gonna have a lot of plants here. Um, 
you know, this is a really, this is called shepherd's purse. Um, it's a really cool little plant. This is pretty close to the trail, so I'm, I ate some of this earlier. It's probably okay. Probably doesn't have any dog pee on it, but you never really can tell. But um, this this plant's really spicy. There's another plant that's going to come up in a, in a few more weeks. That's called peppergrass. That looks really similar to this. And the way I eat this plant, well, you, if you look at it, this is why it's called shepherd's purse. You see, it has these little seed pods that look kind of like a little purse. And we can. We can just start passing some of this around. You guys, you know, look look at some of these things. So the way the way I the way I eat this plant is I just I basically just take it and then skin all the leaves off of the off the stalk and put it in your mouth. And you'll have a little bit of a you know a little bit of a uh, peppery taste just after you eat it. You'll start to feel get a little bit more of that of that peppery. This is a this is a super cool plant too. I don't know if any of y'all know Sam Kishnick. Um, Sam taught me something about this plant that I thought was super cool. It actually hunts for its food. So these little seeds, when they hit the ground, they release two enzymes. One enzyme attracts nematodes. Nematodes are one of the most abundant life forms in our soil. The other enzyme dissolves nematodes, so it attracts nematodes to it and then dissolves them for food. Wow. So it's, it's a pretty cool plant, too. All right, let's, um, let's just, let's go this way. So this actually is a really, is a really special place for plants. Um, the gentleman that started this, this the Cedar Ridge Preserve, uh, named Dr. Jeffrey Stanford, he used to live here. He bought the original 600 acres. His house, that's why this big field is here, his house set right in the middle of the field. And um, he was a plant person. He was friends with Benny Simpson. And so Benny would bring plants to him out here to try. If, if any of y'all know Benny Simpson, he's a, he is a stroker. He's, he's dead now, but he was one of the main people that were promoting uh, drought tolerant and water, you know, um, heat tolerant plants be brought up here. So a lot of these plants they brought and and tested them here. So a lot of the buckeyes that you see, there's a little ironwood. Y'all come on this way. So this is this is the ironwood tree. Um, you know, while we're here, we're just going to go ahead and talk about a couple more trees since we're all close. Uh, pecan tree. So pecan is an Algonquin word that means any nut that it takes a rock to crack. So we still call this tree by its Algonquin name. Um, you know, we all know this is the most economically viable nut crop in the United States. Uh, we all know about pecans, but also these trees have a lot of tannin in them. So just like black walnuts, um, you can take the bark, the cambium layer of the bark of this tree, and boil it down, and and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that too. But um, and make a decoction out of it, and then the tannins that that decoction can be used topically uh, for ringworms or head lice. Now it will turn your scalp kind of brown, but it's a lot better than the poisons they sell in a grocery store. And I don't know if you guys got kids, if they're on the football team, if they're in a drill team, even the cleanest kids come home with lice sometimes. So, um, so then we're gonna talk, we're just gonna go right here and talk about this little guy. Um, so these, um, these, this is all turk scap and it's, the, the leaves are edible, uh, the flowers are delicious and it has a little fruit that's, that's a little, it looks like a tiny apple. One of the names for this plant is manzanilla. So manzanilla means small apple, little apple. So um, this, is, this is a really great plant you can grow. It's not native, but um, I don't believe it's native, but it is a really good, good edible plant. Um, a lot of people don't realize, like when you're tasting flowers off of a plant, most people think of flowers as having just this little pot of nectar in them all the time for the insects to come. Whoever, whoever gets there first gets it. Well, all these plants, they, they evolved with the pollinators that are here. They're all native. And so most plants 
most flowers, most plants let out nectar when it's the most probable time for their pollinators to show up. So a lot of times when I'm leading walks, we'll taste this, we'll taste the flower on this plant in the morning and it tastes okay. You know, it doesn't taste bad or anything, but then you come back in the afternoon and taste it and it tastes really, really sweet. And that's because that has, it has waited for the most appropriate time to let the nectar out uh, so it can get the most benefit from the pollinators. All right, we're just gonna go back across the way here. We'll get out of the bathroom pretty quick here, but. We'll probably look at, at some more uh, yuccas, but yuccas, yuccas are edible. Yuccas have a lot of soapanones in them, means they're very soapy. Uh, one of my favorite ways to eat them is to take the flowers and put them in tempura batter and then fry them. And they are super delicious that way. Um, also, the uh, the roots and the and the leaves, the they're like I said, they're they're really full of soapanones. So you can actually use them to wash uh, dishes and to wash yourself. When you put this in the water and start scrubbing it, it really suds up. They also you can also use the fibers on the inside. They're very very fibrous, um, and this is what natives made uh, cordage out of. So they just would take these and, and put them in the water and hammer them and get lots of little uh, lots of little threads basically. And then to make cordage, it's a twisting process. You twist counterclockwise and yes. Is this, is this the yucca that they make like little French fries out of? Yes, and that would be so before this. So the yucca fries are, and maybe we'll see one around there before it blossoms. It has a stalk that comes up and looks like a giant asparagus. That's what you use for the yucca fries. You cut that off, skin it, and then cut it up. Generally, yucca fries come frozen. Not very many people actually make their own, but uh, there, are, there are a few places that do. Strange Ways in Dallas, if you're ever there, uh, the guy that owns that, his mom makes their yucca fries from scratch. So, um, so there's, a, there's a bunch of weeds here we're gonna talk about, but we'll get to that a little bit later. This one is, uh, Sephora Segundiflora. This is also called um, mountain laurel. Um, mountain laurel, I don't know that it's edible, but um, <laughs> but the seeds, um, these little red seeds that come off of these things are psychoactive. Um, I wouldn't recommend trying them. I don't know the dosage, but um, and a lot of those things, you know, it, you throw up a bunch first before you get high, so sometimes it's not really even worth it. Um, <laughs> make you sick first, yeah. So, uh, Thanks for that morning. Well, <laughs> well, if you do, I'd be interested to know. Um, so we'll come right around the corner here. Okay, this tree is called a toothache tree. It's also, it's got a lot, a lot of common names, spiny ash, toothache tree, uh, tickle tongue. It's called uh, Xanthosylum clavis hercules. Um, the Hercules club is, is what it's called. And generally, my favorite one of these trees, there was a specimen tree right over there out in the middle that died last year and they had, it cut down, had to cut it down, but it is one of my favorite. It's, I saw it coming back, yeah. So it's one of my very, very favorite trees. But uh, the natives and the pioneers would use this. If you'll take a little piece of this and put it like in the back of your mouth and just kind of chew on it. Um, yes, no? The bark. So, sorry. Um, supposedly, the bark of the root is the most potent part. I've never dug it up. Uh, the leaves also uh, are are. Are, uh, will make your will make make your mouth a little bit numb. It's got a pretty distinctive flavor, but put it in one place and just kind of chew it for a while. You've done plenty, huh? Um,
Okay, so the other thing about this tree, this is what makes it hard when there's so many people. The other thing about this tree is this is directly related to Szechuan peppers. So if you look up here and see these little, so these are the little seeds that are coming on. They're going to make a, a little seed pod, and all those little seeds are going to be red. Um, so those things also have the, are, are able to numb. Um, most people do not, so this tree is directly related to Szechuan pepper. Most people don't realize that Szechuan pepper really isn't uh, hot. It's the Thai chilies that are hot. The Szechuan is a numbing, is a numbing uh, agent, so it allows you to eat hotter foods. Hey, How's you made going? it. Yeah, good to what see you. This is this is Xanthas Island Hercules Club. This is Tickle Tongue. <laughs> Got one. Oh, okay. This is so fun. So how cool is that, huh? So, before the 1950s, so we were talking a minute ago about, uh, about Roundup and about glyphosate. Uh, before the 1950s, all of the medications in the United States pharmacopoeia were plant-based. And after the 1950s, when pharmaceutical companies and chemical companies, actually, basically petroleum companies, started making drugs, they started lobbying Congress to have all these medicines replaced with things that were manufactured. Aspirin comes from willow trees, it always has. They manufacture it now, uh, so we don't have to do that. But, um, so it's just like it's just like the glyphosate, just like the Roundup, you know. They, they have slowly taken all this knowledge away from us and, and taken it out of our hands, so we're kind of dependent. And I'm not a, you know, I'm not a survivalist or anything, but. Um, What's the name of this tree? This is, it's Hercules Club. So it's Tickle Tongue, Spiny Ash, Hercules Club. It's got a jillion names. It's an ash. It's an ash. So this is also the uh, host plant for the Eastern Swallowtail Butterfly. So where Dale Clark lives, if y'all know Dale Clark, he lives over in Glen Heights and he raises butterflies, incredible guy. The reason he bought that house is when he showed up there all across the backyard was Xanthas Island growing along the fence. He's like, I'm sold. So this one is um, this one is red bud, and almost all of this is edible. So um, the flowers, it's pretty much flowered out now. Uh, the flowers are very good to eat. They're they're very delicious. Actually, you ought to pick some off here right now because they are super sweet. Um, then the little leaves are edible too, but then the seeds. So these seed pods, these are <laughs> these are really small right now. But these seed pods will fill out, and when they're still bright green, like you see, like like this this I call it like a soft green. So like when they're still this really soft green color, you can use them just like snow peas. So when they're bigger, um, you can use them just like that. Um, we're going to talk about that little tree too. But oh, well, at the end of the season, when they dry out, they're done. No good. Nothing. And even when they, even after they. Even after they lose that bright green color, they're really not that good. They're really kind of tough. So we're going <coughs> to talk about this one right now. almost ate a worm. That's probably been okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. He, he, Is he, he edible? I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so so this, this tree right here, this is... Um, This is called Ilex vomitoria, though, so this is a Yopon holly. Um, yop, native, native Yopon hollies. Um, Yopon is the only tree in the United States that contains caffeine. Um, this is, Yopon is basically matcha. 
So, and I've, I've made tea with this before. Basically what you do is you take the, the tips of the, you take the tips and you put them in the oven at about 200 degrees and you let them sit for about 30 minutes and they'll turn all brown and oily. And then you can either just put them in your food processor and grind them up like regular matcha, or you can just use it, make it like a tea. Um, one of the things I, th I think is interesting about this plant is, is the botanical name. So it's called Ilex vomitoria. So native people, <laughs> native peoples use this plant as a, uh, to break their fast. So like when they would get in a sweat lodge or they would fast for four or five days, the tea from this plant, they called it uh, cassia tea or black tea, was generally what they would use to break their fast. Um, if you've ever fasted for four or five days, you know pretty much anything you eat or drink at the end of that period, you throw up anyway, no matter what it is. I've drank this tea a bunch of times, doesn't even give you an upset stomach, it's, it's really actually good. But what happened was, so the way plants are named, the botanical name for plants, if you discover a plant, you don't get to name it. So generally what happens is you send the plant to a botanist and then the botanist will name the plant. Generally, like when you look around at all these, a lot of plants we've got here, like the Berlandii's, the uh, Drummonds, the, the Muhlenbergi's. So generally what botanists will do is they will name the plant after the person that discovered it in his honor. So Charles Linnaeus wanted to name this plant Ilex cassia for the cassia tea. Uh, they sent it to a botanist in Europe that worked for the East India Trading Company. The East India Trading Company did want, not want any competition from America matcha because they were importing matcha from East Indian. And so instead of going with Charles Linnaeus's, who invented our system, instead of going with his recommendation for the naming, the botanist for the East India Company named it Ilex vomitoria so people would not use it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, everything, so, me, so everything you're talking about, this is a Yopon Holly, right? Yopon Holly. So is it definitively different than the commercial ones? No, buy? they're all the same. It's the same one? That's the same, yeah. The commercial ones are native too, so. She has Two hundred degrees, one hundred seventy-five for about thirty minutes or so, and they'll turn they'll turn dark brown and look really oily. And then I just I just skin the leaves off and and um, you know crush them up and use them as tea. Okay. <clears throat> if you go like I have seen this for sale at the far local farmers market in Austin. In the, on the web, I've you can find it on the web all over the place. It, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's companies that sell your uh, own tea. Yeah, so dandelions are kind of my poster child plant. Um, they, you know, dandelions are one of the things that, you know, Roundup is supposed to keep out of our yard. Well, um, I have a study in, in the truck that anyone wants to look at it from the University of Madison, Wisconsin, and they studied the nutritional value of wild plants compared to plants from the grocery store. About the most nutritional thing you can buy from the grocery store is spinach. And if you take, if you take dandelion, curly dock, which we'll look at, and plantain, plantago, um, you just take those three plants right there. When you look at a quantity of spinach, it might have 150 milligrams of vitamin A, 250 milligrams of vitamin C. That same quantity of dandelion leaves has 1,500 milligrams of vitamin A, 2,500 milligrams of vitamin C. I mean, it's, it's exponentially larger, and we've been told just to get rid of all this stuff. The other thing about it is, you know, we talked about it before. We live here in, in North Texas. We live in the Blackland Prairie, so every, bit of, every part of this plant is useful. The stalk in the springtime, and, and when you think about it, all these, all these weeds that we're talking about, these weeds, Native American people, they lived all winter long mostly on meat and nuts, dried fat, pemmican. Um, so when the springtime came around, their bodies were extremely nutrient deficient. And so these were, this is what would pump their bodies back up. 
and get everything back working again. Uh, you know, the, 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 these things are solid vitamin C. The stems are solid vitamin C. You can make dandelion wine out of the flowers. The leaves are edible. The, the root, there's a big tap root down there. It's, it's kind of like a carrot. And that tap root can be dug up and dried <clears throat> and made into a coffee-like substance. Like I said before, it doesn't have caffeine only. Only the uh, Yopon has caffeine in it. But if you leave them in your yard, what happens is that plant dies, that root dies. So not only does it introduce all this organic matter into the soil, it also leaves this conical depression in our black land prairie, in our black clay, that allows water to percolate into the soil instead of running off. I mean, it's, uh, it's you know, it's about as good as it gets as far as a, a weed goes. Um, yes? Yeah, some of them, I mean, I just taste them. Some of them aren't that great. I mean, I, I like eating native plants. I mostly concentrate on things that taste good. You know, uh, clover, this is about 12% protein, tastes terrible. Um, you know, you could live on it if you had to, but. Um, you know, it seems like I heard somebody made a jam out of the dandelions and that it tasted like honey. I have, I have read about dandelion honey Typically what it is, is you boil dandelion flowers with sugar water and reduce it down to honey. It's te technically not honey, only bees make honey, but it is kind of sweet and it has kind of a dandelion taste. You know, not my thing. Um, Bob, yeah. quick, would you recommend not to eat dandelions from your yard if you fertilize? Yeah, you know, I mean, that's a whole other that's a whole other thing about, and we talked a little bit about it where the dogs were up front. But you know, you want to pick you want to pick your places pretty carefully. Um, you know, not I really I like railroad tracks. I and they're illegal to be on technically. It's private property, but I don't I don't forage on the inside of the tracks because they do spray poison. But on the outside of the borrow ditch and the trees that run along the outside of there, that's a great place to forage because it's all pretty wild, you know. I do this talk in Bishop Arts, walk around one block in downtown Bishop Arts and we talk about 25 to 35 plants. So all these plants are everywhere. They're, they grow all over the place. Um, another one we'll talk about right here, and this is, this is probably my favorite spring edible. Um, Actually, let's let's go over here. Oh, here we go. So this is called chickweed, and basically anything that you can do with arugula, you can do with you can do with chickweed. So I'm just gonna here y'all y'all take a little piece and pass it around. I usually pass it out to everybody, but there's so many of y'all here. Um, so now one of the ways, this, this looks like some other plants, most of them won't hurt you. One of the ways that I use to positively identify this plant is if you will look at the stem of the plant, you will see a single line of hairs growing up the stem. They're, it's all in a line. Um, this, these things, uh, I put them on salads, I put them on pizzas, I make, I have pesto in the truck that I'll let y'all try that I made with this. Uh, it's it's actually very tasty, and y'all are all y'all can pick your own. Y'all are all standing on it too here. Just take one and pass one on. Um, It really is good, isn't it? Very, very mild tasting, very, uh, everyone got some back here? This little guy right here, this is also an edible plant. It's called Belizea. I don't, I don't care for it too much. It's, you know, it's okay. Um, this one also, uh, this is called chickweed. 
this is pretty much played out. You'll still find it. Um, all this plant, this whole plant is edible. There's a red admiral. Um, this whole plant is edible. I really only like the flower parts. Hen bit. I mean hen bit. This is hen bit. Um, so the flowers are, are really good. The rest of it, it's okay. It, to me, it kind of like, like you're trying to swallow a cat's tongue or something. It's really kind of here suit kind of yes I don't know any I don't know any of it I don't know if they if it does um, we're going to talk about one more edible plant over here then we're going to go around the corner um, So uh, this is a great little patch, and there's a bunch of it. Y'all see, you can stand around here. This is all lamb's quarters. And so lamb's quarters is another really good wild edible. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to take a couple of these. So, so this looks like some other plants we have. I'm just going to let, y'all just pass this around so when I'm talking, y'all can see what I'm, I'm talking about. So this looks like American Black Nightshade. Y'all pass some of that around. Uh, the way that you can tell the difference is if you look really close where the stem hits the plant, they have red armpits. So see the little red armpits down there? <clears throat> That's a positive identifier for this plant. And this is great in any time you would, any, for anything you would use spinach for, yeah. Okay, we're going to go around the corner here into the parking lot. Here's another, here's another uh, uh, buckeye. They're, they are kind of hard to tell from the, from the red buds. So this, this tree right here, this little tree, and you'll see that this comes a lot bigger. This is called a gumbamelia, or it's also called chittim wood. Um, most, it's, all, it's a host tree for a longhorn beetle. It looks like a, it's scarab color. It's super cool, it's giant. Um, there's some really big one of bigs one of these in uh, over in Richardson, um, but the interesting thing about this tree to me is most people don't realize that uh, Santa Ana introduced chewing gum to the United States. So Santa Ana was addicted to chewing gum, and if any of you guys are as old as me, you probably remember back in the day when you could get true chiclets from Mexico. So this is a chicle tree. So uh, chittim wood, gum bamelia, um, what you do is you put a little slit in the bark and you let the, let the sap run out. And old chip, chiclets, they were just that sap mixed with a sweetener and a flavorer. And that's all it was. This is not the tree, the, the one down in Mexico uh, is, produces more sap, but this is, this is related to that one, just like the tickle tongue tree related to the Szechuan pepper. Um, and you could you could probably get enough sap out of there to have get some gum. Same method as they extract maple. Maple syrup, uh, same kind of ma tree. maple syrup thing, yeah. yeah. All right, so let's go back here to this field real quick. I'm going to keep stopping, so. <laughs> so this, this little guy right here, this is called uh, Canadian black snake root. 
and the uh, root of this plant is actually an abortificant, so it can be used to induce abortions. That's poison ivy right there. It's actually, a, I, I actually like it. It's got great fall color. Um, it also, um, so in Japan, <laughs> I wouldn't let him get near it now. In, in Japan, they make a, a lacquer out of, it's a, it's a really expensive black lacquer that comes from the oil, it's called Yurishi oil, comes from the oil of the, of the uh, poison ivy. I don't know who the poor guy is that has to get the oil off the plant, but um, it's extremely durable and very dark and very highly prized. So. Real quick before you leave, you were talking about this snake root. Yeah, There's but... Another variety of snake root, right? That, are you familiar with? That, uh, that the root is actually good for respiratory? I don't know that one. Was yeah. there a plain snake root if that exists? I, well, and that's a, that's a common name, so no telling really. Oh, okay. Someone had a Interesting. I love how you I grew up with this grass. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Texas winter grass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, unfortunately, this has already blossomed out, but this is, this, this plant, this, this goes all the way back to my beginnings at Cedar Ridge Preserve, actually, because this is a, um, this is a hackberry tree. And so I was, I was studying landscape architecture at UTA and the guys that were in charge of the architecture program used to bring us out here uh, to do native plant ID. And that's when it wasn't, it was called Green, Green Hills Environmental, Dallas Nature Center back then. And that's when Dr. Stanford still lived here. It wasn't really open to the public. You had to know how to get here. You came through Duncanville, went all the way back through all these weird little neighborhoods. You came to a, uh, a circle, a dead end circle. It had five houses. The house in the middle was empty. Uh, the lot in the middle was empty. You drove through that lot, and that came in back over here um, on the back side of the property. Yeah, you, if you didn't know where it was, you didn't come out here. But anyway, I was out here one week, and I really liked him. I mean, it was, it was super, super knowledgeable. So I'd come back, and he had a little native plant nursery. And we'd dig up trees and stuff and put them in his plant nursery, and he would sell them. Um, he didn't need the money, but just to fund them. And so one weekend I was out here, and I was digging up hackberries, and we were potting them up. And I was like, Dr. Stanford, why are we digging up hackberries? Aren't they trash trees? Trash. And he looked at me and he says, well, how do we know? You know, he said, we're, we're, we're humans. We, ev everything out here has its place in the environment. And, and we're making some kind of anthropomorphic judgment on the value of a tree based on nothing. You know, and it got me to thinking. But also, I call this, the and these are all hackberries, all these trees right around here. I call this the oldest known forage food demand. They dug up, so this tree grows on every continent in the world except the Arctic and the Antarctic. Uh, they dug up a 500,000 year old grave of Peking man and he had hackberry seeds in his little pouch that he'd made from cordage. <clears throat> so the seeds in the springtime when it first starts to bug that bud out, and these are just, I mean, we missed this like a week. These things will be really small and tight and these buds are just absolutely delicious and they're solid full of vitamin C. Um, a little bit later, it's gonna have a little fruit on there and that fruit, um, it has a little skin of fruit on the outside um, and they are kind of sweet if you get them in the fall and put them in your mouth, but really this, this seed on the inside is what was in his pouch. And these things, when they're, when they're crushed like in a, a matate, they are solid protein. So this is a, a really good protein source. Um, it's the leaf bud, right? The, bud. Uh, the seed, the seed. The leaf buds are edible. Yeah, that's what you the seed. The, the thing I was just showing was the seed. So it's these little. Oh, wow. So it's a fruit, um, technically. So we're going to talk about this one, but let's go out here in the field.
Hm? All right, so this is one of my favorite plants. This is, um, it's called Plantago, uh, plantain. And one of the ways that I positively identify this plant is by, by the veinage in the leaves. If you look at the leaves, all the veins, they'll start at the very bottom and they come all the way up to the top. A lot of plants, a lot of little green plants, um, when you look at the leaves, I mean, they have this shape, but you'll see the, all the veins come out sideways. These are palmate and they run all the way, or linear, they run all the way to the end. Um, this plant is great. It's, it's edible. Um, it's great for poison ivy, um, Native Americans. So this, this plant was called white man's footprint, um, just like the white man's fly, uh, the, the European honeybee. So Native peoples knew when this showed up that there were white people not far behind it. Um, this plant was brought over from Europe. It's not native here. Um, like I said, it's, it's very medicinal. The root on this plant, or, or the tea from this plant, was used before the 1950s for dysentery. It can also be used for diarrhea. Um, you just make a tea from the leaves. The root was, um, was chewed by Native American kids as some type of bubble gum. I haven't ever tried it, but... Um, and then the, and this is, this is getting back to what I told you about, um, about the, the pharmaceutical uh, industry in the United States. This is the seed pod. The seed pod has a bunch of little, will have a bunch of little seeds on it. Those seeds are solid psyllium. You guys know this plant. They take it, they, they raise it, they grind those seeds up. They put flavoring and color in them, and they sell it as Metamucil. That's all that's in Metamucil, the seeds of this plant we're talking about right here, besides the other stuff they put in there, besides the, you know, the, the sugar and the flavor, yeah. So, a Plantago. And we have a, I mean, you'll see it growing all over the side of the highway. We have a jillion different kinds. We have narrow leaf plantago. We've got wide leaf plantago. We've got, we've just got a whole, whole bunch of different kinds of plantago. Um, all this growing around here, this little dollar weed, this stuff's all edible too. Um, again, it's more like salad. Um, and then this little plant right here. Oh, I forgot. I'll show y'all something in just a second. This little plant, we can see more of it out there with a the little purple flower. This is called Speedwell. So this plant can be mashed up and used to help uh, help uh, heal cuts and wounds uh, out on the outside of the body. Um, when, when I was talking about preparing foods before, um, one of the ways one of the ways um, I, I was saying you can prepare foods is by making a poultice. The way I make my poultice is I take the plant material. Oh, Speedwell. Mm -hmm. I chew it up until it's real nice and gooky. And then you can rub it on insect stings, poison ivy. I get poison ivy a lot. Three or four years ago, I was showing this. After two weeks, my poison ivy was all gone. But then you just rub it on. Um, and this is, it's good for insect stings, it's good for um, poison ivy, anything that really itches, um, it's, it's really good for all of that. That's the, pl uh, that's the plantain, yeah, plantago. And that's, that's one of the plants that I was talking about, that it's, it's, its nutritional value is, you know, 10 times higher than anything we can buy. The factor of 10. So can you just eat that like salad? Yeah. I, you know, when they get, I like to, that's why I was picking before I started chewing. I like these soft little, the soft little leaves like this. Again, they're kind of her suit, but. Um, all right, onward. That's standing cypress. Yeah. Yeah, don't, don't. Guys, watch out with the standing cypress. Yeah, don't walk through there. So this is a 
this is a weird little plant. So this is a, this here is a wild geranium. Um, this, this little thing right here is, is called broom rape. And it's a, it's a, um, it's a parasitic plant. It does not make uh, chlorophyll. It steals chlorophylls from the plants around it. I've started seeing it the last two or three years. I never used to see it around in, in Dallas Fort Worth area. And last few years, I've started to see it come up everywhere. But it's actually, it's actually stealing chlorophyll from these plants that are around it. This broom rape, these little, this little, they're, <coughs> it, it's, it's weird. It's kind of, it's, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a weird, it's a weird plant. What is, is this edible? I wouldn't. I don't know. Okay, I th this looked a lot better this morning, but um, so they, they mow this area and maybe we'll see some more of this. Um, what I'm looking at is this little pink flower right here. So this, this plant, this little plant right here with a real feathery, um, and all these were open and uh, blooming this morning. Um, with me here here we go okay so oh here, here's some here, here we go yeah i wish this was taller so y'all could see it better but this this will do um so this plant is uh called stork's bill and it is a lactation aid. So for any mammals, whether it's, it's humans or uh, livestock, uh, tea made from the leaves uh, will, um, will help to increase lactation or start lactation. Um, what I was looking for and what's really interesting about it is that this is the seed. It looks like a stork's bill. And it's interesting to me that they call this stork's bill, the seed looks like a stork's bill, and then it also has um, properties to help with babies. <laughs> How in the world do you ever determine that, you know, something like this aids in lactation? It's just fascinating. Well, it's all this plant knowledge that, all this plant knowledge that we've lost, you know? I mean, people, and people ask all the time, you know, there's things that, you know, like poke that you have to boil it three times. And people say, well, how did, how did they figure that out? I say, they got nothing but time and they're hungry. And so once you figure something Try out, then you, you just pa you just keep on passing it down. So it's all, you know, it's all oral knowledge, you know, yeah. that uh, hungry people with nothing but time on their hands figured out. That's, that's Speedwell. So that's the Speedwell. So this is the one that's good for cuts on the, on the body. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, this, this we'll, we'll go over here and have a little, have a look. I just didn't really... Um, yeah, but it was all, man, it was really big and beautiful this morning. It got hot. Oh, here we go. So this generally grows where it's really wet. This is a plant, this is called curly dock. And curly dock is one of the three plants I was talking about earlier uh, with the, with the, um, and this will also grow a gigantic seed head on the top. And those seeds, you can you can kind of thresh them and use them um, use them in um, in bran muffins or something. And and my buddy John Wolf used to say that you know when you make uh, uh, flapjacks or muffins out of the seeds of this, it's like eating a bran muffin with X lax on top. It will move <laughs> it through you. But this also, so if you dig this. If you dig this plant up, this is edible also, but if you dig it up, it's got a root like a ginseng root. This is, this is directly related to the burdock that grows up north. So this plant w is a, a liver cleanser. So if you've had chemotherapy or a recovering alcoholic, this plant will help to clean out the liver. Uh, a tea made from the root of this plant. What's the name? Uh, curly dock. It's a dock. So just like burdock, curly dock, yeah, yeah, and it'll and it'll look like um, it, it, the the roots look 
you know, if you get a good healthy one, it looks like a little ginseng guy, if you've ever dug ginseng. So you just boil it in water and have them drink it? Uh, no, it's the root. You have to oh, dig up the root, oh, and dig up the root. The you, you could eat the leaves. Yeah, that might help. Mm -hmm. I would, this is this is kind of rough. I, again, just like the plantain, I would look for the, you know, the really soft young leaves. Um, and this usually grows really big. This is not near water, so I'm not really sure why it's growing here. It's a low place. Here's a bigger one. So this is what it. This is what the what the um, storks bill normally looks like. It's taller than everything around it, and it just sticks up. That's a better idea of, of what the plant is. All right. So those iris are not native. Y'all hear the barred owls talking in there? I could hear some barred owls hooting. Bard, B-A-R-R-E-D. Okay, we're gonna look for some more of this and see how many of y'all we can get to, to taste. But this is, this is Greenbrier. It's also, uh, the botanical name is Smilax. So, and there's a bunch of different varieties of this stuff. Um, when it's growing in the spring like this, these little shoots are absolutely delicious. They taste a lot like asparagus. Um, and these different varieties are really thick and so sometimes I'll just, I'll pick a bunch, I'll take them home and just stir fry them in some olive oil real fast and then put a little bit of really coarse, coarse salt on them. Oh, that, yeah, and there's a bunch more around the corner, so we'll see if we can find enough for everyone to eat. They are very good, huh? It's, it's uh, cat's claw, cat, uh, green briar. Oh, it's cat's claw? Yeah, but you got to get it when it's, so you got to get the part that's um, real... Yeah tender when it's first growing like that like that bright green color they ate it all of them there okay who all didn't have any yet Y'all had some? Anyone want some? I already had some. It's good, huh? We tried it already. You said this little one is Speedwell, or what is this? Uh, one of the, this is this is Speedwell. This is Speedwell. This one, I don't, you know, I don't know that okay. one. And I've, I've heard, it's like a guy who knew all way more than me told me it was rabbit tobacco, but every time I look up rabbit tobacco, I get something that grows up north, so I don't know okay. the botanical name of it. So this one is this one. We're talking about the same briar that we curse as we're, yeah. we're walking through the oh, forest. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I know, that's yeah. why I was like shocked. Yeah, that's the same now. ones, yeah. See all those see all see all those little berries on there? They're red. Usually they're orange. And it's dried. I mean it's a little bit drier, okay. but and a question on the Hercules uh -huh. plant. Um, do the seeds taste like Szechuan pepper? Uh, they do. There it is Szechuan pepper, and you can grind them up and use them in place of Szechuan pepper.
so I brought a bunch of books for you guys to look at. I'm, I need a, I do, I probably need an intervention, but. Um, Yeah, yeah, the outside, those are really old. Those are last year's, so they're probably not that great. But, um, yeah, those are all last year's. Uh, which, which one? Oh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, these are mostly just books on, on actual edible plants. Um, So, um, so I do, so there's a lot of different ways. I'm going to pass this around just so y'all can. So here we were talking about the cleavers. This is how I use a dehydrator. So generally I would not recommend putting your products in plastic, but I use a dehydrator to make sure it's all completely dried out. This is cleavers, the, the uh, lymph cleanser I was talking about. Um, this is, uh, ha uh Stinging nettle. Stinging nettle is really good. Um, I'm going to pass this around. There's there's Monarda out in the field. This is just bees balm, Monarda fistulosa. This is great for colds and coughs. The way I use this is I have a um, I have a um, French press coffee pot, and so I'll take one or two of these. I'll stick it down in a French press. I'll pour boiling water on it. I'll put the the plunger in and let it sit on top and for about five minutes and then when I'm pushing it down I try to inhale all that steam and then I drink the tea. When you when you guys smell this you're going to recognize it. This is thymol. Thymol is what was in the original Listerine. So um, this is this is actually two years old even so um, two years old. So let me This is, um, huh? No, it smells like, yeah, it's really strong. It smells like disinfectant. Um, so I'm, I'm also a beekeeper. I brought some honey if y'all want to try this. This is also, this is, this is jelly I make from Mexican plums. So this is local native, native jelly. I harvested these last year. My daughter's favorite jelly. Okay, so um, we we ate the we ate chickweed earlier. Um, so I make I make pesto with chickweed. This is a dip I made. It's it's basically just cottage cheese with pesto whizzed up. So with my pesto recipe, what I do is I'll substitute one of the cups of basil for one of the cups for a cup of chickweed, and so that's what this is. Um, you can either try it on those or on the crackers, and then this. Um, this is the Mexican plum jelly. Yep. And then there's some honey. This came out of my backyard, if y'all want, over in Dallas. Um, Bob, we would typically call this plum just a wild plum, right? Mexican plum. Yeah, Mexican plum, wild plum. So, um, so the other ways that I, some of the other ways that, like that I keep my my medicines is I just I keep them in paper so I dry them and then put them in paper so that they don't uh, so they won't get any moisture in there and they won't start to spoil um, prairie tea this I harvest this in the fall this is a really good little local tea um, y'all can just pass some of that around and smell it some of it. Um, but so whenever I'm out and I find stuff that I like, Skull's Cap, this is a great sleep aid. Uh, so I'll just, I'll just pick it up and bring it home with me. Gamma, this is a reishi mushroom. I cut it off of a live oak tree in front of the Lakewood Library. Um, so this stuff grows everywhere, you know. Um, I'm also a big, 
So this is this is the best foraging tool known to man. Um, it's called a soil knife from from A. M. Leonard. It is a wonderful tool for everything. Um, I'm also a big believer in essential oils and also homeopathics. So in the United States, we don't really believe in homeopathics too much uh, because we don't think they have enough medicine in them. Uh, but homeopathics work. Uh, this, is, uh, this is arnica, comes from a plant called Montana arnica, grows north of us, grows in Colorado. Um, this one's sinusalia, this is for uh, hay fever. This, is, this comes from belladonna and it grows here, it goes from nightshade. Um, and what they do is they dilute it and dilute the dilution and dilute the dilution until there's just very little in it. You know, Western medicine, we treat a symptom. So if we've got a runny nose, we give us something that just dries us up. You know, it doesn't really do anything, but, but homeopathics, they go, they work with the body to actually resolve the problem so that it quits coming back. Um, you know, the arnica, you can get that in a bunch of different meth, a bunch of different ways. You know, there's all kinds of natural medicines out there if you just look for it. This is one of my favorite pain relievers, and it's from a leaf, but the only thing in here is camphor and menthol. Uh, they make a roll-on and they make a, uh, they make a gel. The, the aerosol is really cold when it goes on and it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's a, it's a leaf, but it's not. I mean, when you look at it, there's nothing in it. Camphor and menthol, that's all that's in there. There's no, there's no, there's no aspirin in it. Um, so then I also collect, like this is a turkey tail. So Tremetes versicolor, so this mushroom, you can make a tincture out of this. It's really good for curing all kinds of cancer. Um, these are Western soap berries. You can go online and buy, uh, they're called soap nuts if you go on Amazon, and they come from China. Uh, soap nuts are basically the same as this. They're just bigger. Um, these are China berries? No, these are, this is Sapendus Drummondi, so this is Western soap berry. So the, the, the soap nuts, you know, they're just larger. They come from China, and these are kind of dry. I got these last, I got these uh, just a little while ago, and they're from last year. So I use these in my outdoor shower. These are, these are basically like soap. For years, I looked for a recipe on how to make soap from these, but there is so much soap in them that you don't even need a recipe. If you want to just put it in some water and boil it until it becomes kind of like a, a paste and then cool it off and cut it up. What I do is I put them in, uh, in a little muslin bag and I use them in my outdoor shower. You can use them in your, you can use them in your, um, in your bath. Is your water cold? Yes. No, not, no, not that cold. I just want to leave. Um, Again, a local tree. A local tree, yep. And it's not a china berry tree. Nope, it looks like china berries. A little, little bit more, yep. My mom Keep used going. to use it as a racist dog. A little bit more, one more. It's a blue. Really? Yeah, back in the 50s. It makes sense. Okay. It's so, and this doesn't work as well with cold water. I meant to get some water from the... This thing will stay like that. We could have done it before we walked, and it would be like that when we came back. So instead of, you know, they recommend using, using three or four um, fr of the Chinese variety. I just use 10 or 12 of these that grow here and they're free. So. Do you know if there's any out here? Um, right now they still all have the seeds on them because the birds don't eat them because they're, they're so soapy. Um, uh, yeah, they don't like poop and foam. So it's pretty easy. Yeah, they're pretty, they don't have leaves on right now, and they're, yeah. Can I just make a comment? Yeah. Uh, about collecting. Um, yeah, yeah, we're on a preserve, so, and we've actually kind of pushed the limit on what we've eaten, probably, though we are eating weeds, they'll be gone in a few months, but still. So, yeah, you can't really collect here. Yeah, yeah. If you want, just come and talk to us, and then we'll tell you how we talk to you and stuff like that. But it happens in the summer, you people come and take middle, moss, take rocks, I just took the seed out, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. I just squeezed the seed out of the center of it. Yeah. So there's other stuff, like I, get, I gather this. This is, um, this is whorehound. I get this down in the hill country. Um, these are great for sore colds and cough. Um, you can go to the Ace Hardware store and buy whorehound candy. I mean, this is, uh, it's, it's, you can make your own. I've tried making hard candy. You gotta boil it really hot for really long. All mine came out as syrup, 
So um, there's also, so I was talking about the tinctures. So this is, this is a tincture I make. Um, oh, so um, we have a, little, a plant called mullen and it's really not up yet. We didn't see it walking today. Okay, oh yeah. And we can walk, oh, they're out in front over here by the barn. And in the, I can't tell if that's a stalk on it. It's also called beggar stalk because what happens? So it grows, the first year it grows, well, I thought I had some with me. Um, the leaves, so the first year it grows a rosette. Those are the ones you want to use for medicine. So the leaves are good for respiratory problems. In the old days, they used to smoke it, not realizing that was probably <clears throat> not the best thing for your respiration problem. But, um, but it also, so the first year it grows this big rosette. Those are the medicinal leaves you want to use. The second year, the rosette is still there and it'll grow this stalk. And that's what they call the beggar stalk. And on the top of it, it'll just have a whole progression of little yellow flowers all summer long. And what I do is I take those little flowers I pick them and I put them in a little a little jar of uh, full of organic coconut oil and I let them sit there for four or five months. I'll shake it every two or three days in my cabinet and then when it's done I strain it out and then this is what I was talking about is really good for the little ulcers in your mouth or for uh, ear infections. Um, this is a, an elixir I make, a, an immune booster. This is elderberry. So we have tons of elderberries. The last few years they've been growing like crazy around um, around Dallas. The problem is the birds get the seeds really, the berries really quick. So what I do is I use the flowers and I'll make a tincture out of the flowers. This is 150 proof Bacardi rum. So it's not only is it a immune booster, but it's a mood elevator also. Um, but then, you know, then my favorite, my favorite sun, my favorite sunburn lotion is I just fill this thing up with distilled water. It's a uh, peppermint, uh, essential oil, lavender essential oil, and a little a, a little frankincense. You don't really even need the frankincense. Shake it up every time, put it on. Great stuff. So. You didn't mention aloe vera in that. Well, I don't have it. I mean, I I make this stuff. So. It works too, correct? Yeah, yeah, it works too. Okay, so what I'm throwing is lavender. Uh. Like a lotion. Yeah, it's just lavender essential oil, just like, just lavender essential oil, uh, peppermint essential oil. So basically, it's just this in distilled water in a little spray bottle. Sunburn? sunburn. It's okay. wonderful. Yeah. Also, oven burn. Our oven burn. Yeah, yeah, oven burn. I keep pure lavender oil in my kitchen. Yeah, yeah, it's good. No, it works. Um, so that's what I got for you. So I'll, I'll leave you with a little quote from uh, Thomas Rainier. He was an environmentalist. He's a landscape architect, and he says, the, uh, the next renaissance of human culture will be the reproduction of the natural world in our cities, and plants will be at the center of it all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.